Good evening, everyone. On behalf of today's volunteer crew from two CNPS chapters, a warm welcome. My name is Madeline Morrow, and I'm your co-host, along with Sue Rosenthal from the East Bay chapter. I'm um, past president of Santa Clara Valley chapter. Tonight's Q&A moderator is Sin Colubris from the East Bay chapter. Our YouTube moderator is Robin Mitchell from the East Bay chapter. And tech support is from by Vivian New, our current Santa Clara Valley chapter president. Before we begin, I'd like to ask, how many are attending a CNPS meeting for the first time? Please raise a virtual hand or type into the chat box. We'd love to hear how you heard about tonight's program. Great. For newcomers, this meeting is organized by the California Native Plant Society and it's a nonprofit environmental organization going back to 1965. We've got over 10,000 members in 35 chapters spread, spread all over California and into Baja, California. We're, the Santa Clara Valley chapter covers Santa Clara and Southern San Mateo. And I think Sue Rosenthal will tell you how many counties East Bay covers, whether it's both Alameda and Contra Costa or not. And the mission of CNPS is to save California's native plants and habitats. And this organization brings together science, education, conservation, and gardening to power the native plant movement. So we encourage you to join CNPS. You support this great conservation, this great conservation organization, and you get some really great benefits. There are two journals one of them, um, Flora, is a general readership um, with articles about gardening, wildlife, plants, all kinds of, uh, with fantastic photography. The science-based journal, which will be soon changing its name from Vermontia, is also has very accessible, but both scholarly and accessible articles. If you join our chapter, we have a chapter newsletter, The Blazing Star, and East Bay also has a chapter newsletter. There are discounts at supporting news, news nurseries and much more. And to join CNPS, you can go to um, their website, www.cnps.org slash join. Some of, we have lots of um, events for our Santa Clara Valley chapter. Just about one every Wednesday, our um, next event, is going to be a photography group show and tell on Friday, March 26th. And you're welcome to come and observe, but it's a very friendly, informal group. And we invite you also to, um, we invite you to, to show photos if you're interested. You can check them, check it out on our, um, on our Facebook page or meetup group. 
Then we have um, a garden talk coming up for Fantastic Garden on March 31st, a tour of Chris Kaminsky's um, fantastic large garden with mature, many mature Cianothus in East San Jose. Um, we have you know, native plant pollinators and gardening for native bees talks coming up and an exciting talk about the flora of the San Joaquin Desert. Uh, if you've been missing your trips to go see flowers, this would be a great thing to visit. So our events are on, um, they're listed on our chapter website, meetup.com and announced on the chapter news mailing list. More about that later. And we also have a plant nursery, a native plant nursery. We have switched to ordering online and you can uh, pick them up or get delivery, curbside pickup. This is the main fundraiser for our chapter. And we, in addition to fantastic plants, we have t-shirts from our Going Native Garden Tour. Oops. And um, plant signs, some books and more plants are added all the time, so check out our um, our square site to see what is what is available. And if you don't want to remember that, you can just go to our website and look for gardening nursery, and I'll give you a link. And now I'm going to turn this over to uh, Sue Rosenthal of the East Bay chapter. Hi everyone. Um, Sorry. Oh, am I visible on your screens? Yes. Good. Okay, great. Um, we are really happy to be here tonight um, co-hosting with Santa Clara Valley. Um, as we all know, Zoom has its advantages and its disadvantages. But one of the very nice advantages is that we can easily bring together our East Bay and Santa Clara Valley CNPS audiences. Um, and um, we do cover two counties here as does the Santa Clara Valley chapter. We're Alameda and Contra Costa counties. And when I was thinking about this, I realized that our two adjacent chapters cover a really large portion of the Bay Area and our memberships combined represent one fifth of the membership of CNPS statewide. That is quite impressive. So um, if anybody who's watching isn't a member and wants to push us up closer to one quarter of the, um, of the statewide membership, please feel free to join one of our chapters. We'd be happy to welcome you. Um, so the East Bay chapter was actually the founding chapter of CNPS back in 1965 when there was only one chapter and it was called CNPS. Um, our, as I said, our chapter area now is just Alameda and Contra Costa counties, but we're still going strong. We're happy to be offering a few more of our activities for people interested in native plants than, than we were a year ago. Um, our presentations like tonight's are necessarily still online for the time being but we will be starting to offer small, safe, socially distanced habitat restoration activities and field trips as our local state and federal guidelines allow. But we are, we are looking to start doing that soon. And you can learn about all of what we do and how you connect, can connect with the East Bay chapter by visiting our website, which is um, ebcnps as in eastbaycnps.org. Um, and that website will lead you to our social media accounts and more. Um, so um, next slide. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we've been operating, we also have a nursery. We've been operating our nursery, which is called Native Here which is a nonprofit year round nursery that directly benefits our East Bay chapter. Um, we've been operating it for more than 25 years. And at Native Here, we, we specialize in plants native to our two county area, Alameda and Contra Costa counties. But most of them also grow in other parts of the Bay Area 
as well as other parts of the state. And they're great for home gardens in many areas. So um, the, the nursery is in uh, the Berkeley Hills, actually in Tilden Regional Park. Um, the website for the nursery is nativeherenursery.org, which will give you directions how to get there. Um, right now, we are just operating with online sales and um, contactless pickup, but um, we hope you'll, you'll check out our nursery and see if there's some plants there that you like. Um, so overall, we are just really happy tonight to have the opportunity to connect with a broader audience, and we look forward to more collaborations. Thank you, Sue. I just want to put up this slide to we all talked about getting, you know, getting in contact with us. Here are the ways to contact the Santa Clara Valley chapter and the East Bay chapter. Um, we invite you to join the Santa Clara Valley mailing list, which sends out announcements once a week. And the subscribe is there. You can also get to it from our cnps-scv.org um, website. And for East Bay, you want to go to their website slash subscribe to get the details to get notices um, from them. And you know, you can sign up on both of them. And also, if you decide to join CNPS, you are you can affiliate with two chapters, which means you can get, you know, chap, you know, newsletters as a member from two chapters. And before we get started with our presentations, we're going to keep people muted. We're going to ask for questions to be typed or comments to be typed in the chat box. You can do that at any time and we will um, pick them up and read them out loud. Um, we are expect to finish by approximately 9 p.m. But um, tonight is a really busy program, so it may run a little long and this program is on YouTube and you will be able to see it later. So if you wanted to check something out again or tell your friends to check it out, it will be on our YouTube channel. We'll have the um, way to get to that at the at the end. And our first presenter is a scholarship recipient from my mouse is very sensitive. Um, Martin Purdy is a the recipient of the Santa Clara Valley Chapters Don Mayall Conservation Graduate Research Scholarship. He is at the Claremont Graduate School in the California Botanical Garden. And there's a wonderful picture of his study site. And I would like to turn it up. Oh, and he's been exploring the flora of the Coyote Ridge area, a 50 square mile alpine site located in Northwest Inyo County for the past year, which is in this picture. And this year he's going to document the diversity and distribution of vascular and non-vascular plant species, publish a voucher-based annotated checklist of plants, and provide this information to Inyo National Forest, California Native Natural Diversity Database, and other appropriate agencies. And he's working with the Santa Anna Botanical Garden Herbarium. I'm going to turn this over to Martin. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Madeline. And let me just uh, share my screen now so I can pull up my presentation. Bear with me for a moment as I get oriented. Okay. Okay, how does how does that look? Does that sound good? Excellent. Okay, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and I just have a short talk uh, preceding Dr. Krantz's. Um, and uh, as Madeline said, my name is Martin Purdy. I'm a master's a student at California Botanic Garden and Claremont Graduate University. Uh, this is my second year. And I've done one and a half years of field season on my master's thesis. And I have one more uh, field season coming up this summer before I'm going to graduate. 
And my thesis is a floristic inventory of Coyote Ridge and Coyote Flat in Inyo County, California. Now, uh, many of you probably know what a floristic inventory is, but uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, in short, uh, you can define it as the thorough documentation of plant diversity within a specific area. And you can accomplish this in different ways, but specifically, I'm achieving this through the collection of herbarium vouchers, which are physical pressed plant specimens that are going to ultimately be stored in an herbarium, which is a museum for pressed plants. Um, I'm also documenting the plant diversity at my study site through iNaturalist observations, which I'm sure many of you know about being in the Bay Area. It's a, a Bay Area nonprofit. If, if you don't know about iNaturalist, I, I recommend you, you go to their website and check it out. But um, this is a citizen science platform where uh, you can document uh, any organism, any life through georeference photos. And what I'm doing is, so I'm taking pictures I'm collecting plants in my study area and I'm taking photos of them and I'm combining those two things. And I'm just going to pull up the chat here so that I can see it as well. Yes, thank you for posting that link. But, um, and in combining herbarium specimens and iNaturalist vouchers, um, you, you can get something um, kind of that is like an extended specimen. Um, and I plan on doing this by using links on my herbarium labels, which are QR codes shown here in the lower left of this figure. Um, so any smartphone can scan a QR code and it can take you to this website um, with photos of the plant in the field. And this is really powerful because many characters um, are not well preserved on herbarium specimens, such as flower color or the three dimensional shape of uh, a plant. And so having photos as well as the press specimen um, can help a lot with identification. So why do a floristic inventory? Uh, before you can do anything with plants, you need to know where they are. Um, and a floristic inventory is, is vital to our understanding of, of plant diversity, species ranges, and threats to rare and endangered species with uh, which Dr. Krantz will be talking more about later. Um, and second, it's a lot of fun. I can't lie that that's one big motivation for me and why I'm doing this research. And I included this slide in my presentation just to show that we think of California as being botanically relatively well known, but there are many portions of the state which have seen few to no uh, botanic collections or plant collections. And these are illustrated in the left figure here um, where the white pixels represent plant collections uh, housed in herbaria in California. And the black portions represent what we can call botanic black holes. So those are regions that have few to no collections. And there may be species there, um, rare species or undescribed species uh, just waiting to be discovered. And in the right, this is the same information, just presented in a different way, where the white spaces are the botanic black holes and the colored pixels um, show collection effort with different colors representing different densities of collections. Oh, and then I, I have this red uh, circle here. This is approximately where my study area is, uh, which is not maybe the, the most, it's not the most known area of California, botanically speaking, uh, nor the least. But I did choose to um, locate my study area there because there are a few historical collections. So I realized in making this presentation um, that uh, there could be some confusion because there's a Coyote Ridge uh, near to all of you in the Bay Area. Um, and I want to be very clear that we are talking about, or I'm talking about this Coyote Ridge in in Yo County, California, and not this Coyote Ridge. But uh, they're both cool Coyote Ridges and they actually share some similarities like unusual rock types, which host unusual plant species. And this is just a zoomed in view of the central and Southern Sierra Nevada, 
showing my study area and just to highlight a few landmarks in the area. There's Mono Lake to the north, is the White and Inyo Mountains to the east. Mount Whitney is down there and uh, the town of Bishop, California is just northeast of my study area. So this is a, a cool perspective of my study of the site, again, uh, outlined in red here. So the project boundaries are in red because um, it shows some of the local topography and highlights what I think are some of the unique qualities of this area when compared to adjacent areas of the Sierra Nevada. And for orientation, we're looking sort of south southwest, so sort of towards Southern California and the Pacific Ocean. And I want to highlight two things in this photo, which is that uh, my study area, Coyote Ridge here and Coyote Flat, is east of the crest of the Sierra Nevada. So it's in the rain shadow of the Sierra Nevada, which has some in important implications for the types of plants that we expect to grow there. And the second thing I want to emphasize is that Although much of my study area is above tree line, it's uh, mostly alpine and subalpine, entirely alpine and subalpine, but there's a lot of alpine terrain. Um, the alpine terrain lacks signs of recent glaciation. Um, things like U-shaped valleys and talus fields and cirques. So there are these topographic signs of glaciation that are largely absent from, my, from this area um, that you can see kind of in the surroundings here in Nevada. Um, and this, this means that this area may have escaped glaciation and uh, may be a glacial refuge for some alpine plant taxa where they could have survived um, in sight uh, while glaciers kind of scraped everything else clean. So just to reiterate um, that first point, um, the area contains multiple disjunct habitats, which are naturally uncommon or fragmented within the region. That's one reason to do a floristic inventory here. Um, one thing that I, that I just mentioned briefly earlier is that it, there's also um, kind of strange rock types on Coyote Ridge. So your Sierra Nevada range is mostly granite, but there's a lot of marble here and marble often has unusual plants associated with it. And as I also briefly mentioned earlier, there's no uh, relatively few historical collections and uh, no existing comprehensive inventory of the area. So uh, the potential for many new discoveries. And of course, I, I'd be remiss without mentioning that it's beautiful. And I think, you know, you can, you can say that what you, your, your study of choice or your location where you do your research is beautiful and still, I think, do good science. So I want to emphasize that I, I do feel really privileged to do my field work in this location. And there's another uh, photo to emphasize the beauty. So uh, briefly, and let me just look at my time. So I'm on track, okay. Um, to date, I've done one and a half seasons of field work, 53 days of field work, uh, about 780 collections, 653 iNaturalist observations, and I've located seven new CNPS ranked plants, so rare species that were not found there before, and uh, two new records for the Southern Sierra Nevada. And uh, this is just a summary of kind of my collection effort here on the left. And with the, the very little remaining time I have left, uh, this is a super quick uh, plant quiz that I wanted to do for you guys. So if you have any guesses on the either family, genus, or common name or species of, of these plants, I'm gonna leave the slideshow on each picture for 15 seconds and type your guesses into the chat. And I'll, I'll give you some, some gold stars or platinum stars if you get it right. So I'm gonna leave it here for another few seconds. Does anyone have a guess? Okay, Brassicaceae. Yes, very good. This is Brassicaceae. So there's two gold stars there, Dagger Pod, Chloe, uh, <laughs> Hit it on the, uh, this is a Anelsonia uricarpa, which is a monotypic species in California. Tiger pot is the common name. Okay, I expect all of you to know this one, uh, or not all of you, but the Santa Clara, Clara Valley folks to know it at least. Yes, it's a Menzelia blazing star. This is Menzelia levocollis. Um, all of these plants are from my study area, I think, uh, if I didn't make that clear already. 
This is uh, another one of my favorites from Coyote Ridge. Any guesses on family or genus? The genus is hard, but the family is is uh, is is more evident. I think Astragalus is a really good guess, um, and that's what I thought it was when I first found it. But this is actually Oxytropus. Uh, look, Dr. Kranz got it right, of course. The base E, yes. Okay. What about this? Ariagonum, very good. Gold star to, to Judy. Ariagonum, Madeline got it too. This is Ariagonum umbilatum, uh, subspecies Nivale. And I think this is my last one. Uh, I think the family is easy on this one, but the genus is hard. This is kind of a weird genus. Grindelia is a good guess, but it's not Grindelia. And, and I'll let you know what it is because I think I'm, I'm over time. Pyrocoma is another good guess, but this is a uh, Tonestus pearsonii, common name Pearson's Tonestus or serpent weed, um, which is a pretty narrow endemic to my study area. And it's a CNPS rare plant. And with that, thank you. A big thank you to, to uh, uh, everyone at CNPS and CNPS Santa Clara Valley chapter for help funding this research. And I thank you to my field assistants. And um, yeah, that is, that is it. I'm ready for questions. Should I stop uh, sharing my screen or? Yeah, it makes it a little easier to see if we stop sharing screen at this point. Okay, I'll do that. So, um, so I can. Cindy, do you wanna do these questions? Uh, sure, uh, I can help through and answer some of these questions now. Can, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I'll I'll hit you with the questions, Martin. You just Sounds have to good. come up with the answer. Okay. What that. is the elevation of Coyote Ridge? Good question. Um, the as I have it defined, the range is from eight thousand five hundred feet to thirteen thousand five hundred feet. At uh, Cloud Ripper Peak is the is the high point at thirteen five. Oh. Okay, so which plants are the new records for the Sierra Nevada? So the, there's two plants that are new records for the Southern Sierra Nevada, and that's uh, Pisaria kingii, um, which is called, uh, what's the common name on that? I'm, I'm, I'm so much in science world now that, that's like, it's a Brassicaceae, um, uh, King's Pisaria probably. And then the other new record and I think this is a this should be a new record for the whole Sierra Nevada range, not just the Southern Sierra Nevada. Is Angelica kingii? Okay. And, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, we have. Um, where are you filing your herbarium sheets? Another good question. So I'm trying to collect when the population allows for the for the collection of multiple uh, specimens. I'm co collecting in triplicate, so I'll get three copies of of each collection and and so on the primary sheets are going to california botanic garden where i'm a student and, and duplicate sheets will be sent to other regional herbaria probably i'll send some to california academy of sciences and uc jepson uh, and some will go to the Inyo national forest herbarium as well well who would know that plants generate so much paperwork <laughs> <laughs> so how long is your field season uh, it's it's pretty short because of the high elevation of my study right. area. So it like last year, I first went out in early June, and then my last um, my last trip was in late August. So it's really just concentrated Thank in those you. months. Three months, all yeah. right. Three months to study, nine months to do paperwork. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. All right. It looks like oh, here's one more. Is there a species that you are hoping to find? Um, that's a that's a good question. There's a lot of there's a lot of cool. What's one in particular? Uh, I have trouble with this. There's this rock petro petrophylla, this this rosaceae shrub that grows on like limestone cliffs that's found in the whites and the inyos and in Death Valley. And it could be in my study area. There's there's things that jump over Owens Valley from the Whites and the Inyos that show up on Coyote Ridge, and they they aren't anywhere else. So I'm hoping to find some more of those those plants that have kind of jumped over the desert. 
Ooh, that would be interesting. Okay, cool. All right, so I think yep, I think that gets to be the end of our Q&A and we're gonna roll over to the next portion of the presentation meeting. So thank you very much, Martin. And there's a lot of really nice comments in the chat and people are very interested in hearing more about your research. And if um, you save the chat, you could uh, see all those comments. Thanks a lot. Um, and you know, people can save the chat by going down to the bottom where you type those three dots. What you can, if you click on those, one of your options is to save chat and it's saved on your home computer. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Sue Rosenthal again. Okay, um, I have the honor tonight of introducing our speaker and um, all of us here at the Santa Clara and East Bay chapters of CNPS are very pleased and have the honor of welcoming Dr. Tim Krantz as our speaker tonight. Dr. Krantz is a botanist, environmental planner, and professor. His day job is professor and chair of the environmental studies department of um, <clears throat> the University of Redlands. And in his moonlight job, he serves as the founding director of the Southern California Montane Botanic Garden at the Wildlands Conservancy's Oak Glen Preserve. He's a frequent speaker and featured media expert on environmental issues ranging from drought in California to the impacts of fracking on California's groundwater supplies. Um, he's also the foremost authority on the flora of the San Bernardino Mountains and is an internationally recognized authority on California's largest lake, the Salton Sea. Now, in spite of all those Southern California connections, Dr. Krantz also has strong roots in the Bay Area. He received his master's from Stanford in Latin American studies and his PhD from Berkeley, UC Berkeley in geography. And he is here tonight because he so impressed and inspired CNPS Chapter Council delegates with his presentation and field trip at one of the quarterly statewide Chapter Council meetings that two of the delegates from the Santa Clara Valley and the East Bay Chapter vowed to bring him to the Bay Area to speak. Um, thanks to Zoom, it's a little bit easier to do that now than, than it might be under normal circumstances. And we are very, very pleased to be able to host this presentation by Dr. Krantz. Um, Dr. Krantz's passion is rare plants and protecting them along with their habitats. And he's the recipient of many awards and honors, many international awards and honors. Um, and one of them is the CNPS Rare Plant Conservation Award. So tonight he will be sharing with us his expertise and wisdom in order to inspire us and teach us how to save wildflowers and become better advocates for California's rare plants. So thank you so much, Dr. Krantz, for being here. And on behalf of East Bay and Santa Clara Valley CNPS, welcome. Thank you, Sue. Um, hello, everyone. And uh, it is my pleasure to talk to you this evening, uh, virtually, to all of my uh, friends and uh, what have you up in the Bay Area, but also um, wherever you are in California. And um, so it's my pleasure to uh, talk to you tonight about how to become a better wildflower advocate or a rare plant advocate. And so with that, um, I think I will go ahead and I'm going to share this presentation with you. There we go. Okay, so um, let me close some of these other boxes I have that cover my screen so I can see what I'm sharing with you. All right, so um, saving wildflowers, how to be, be a more effective rare plant advocate. And this uh, covering 
photo is from North Baldwin Lake, where Ken Berg, who I saw is also in the audience there, and I have explored for many years. Uh, when I first graduated from the University of Revlins with my bachelor's degree in 1977, and I was hired by the US Forest Service to uh, do some rare plant surveys. At the time, rare plants weren't covered by the Endangered Species Act yet. And so uh, these were inventories to see which plants may in fact uh, have warranted formal federal protection under the Endangered Species Act. And um, let's see, I'm having trouble advancing this slide. So not quite sure what the problem is. You know, I have watched this happen a few different times. Oh, you did it. Oh, there so we go. I just never need to mind. click on it. <laughs> okay, so one of the things about these rare plants is each one has its own story. And so as, as we explore the world of rare plants uh, throughout California, um, I encourage you all to get to know them. Uh, like they, they become good friends. And so one of the first ones that I worked with was what we call the birdfoot checker bloom, Sedalcia pedata. And the leaves are in fact very finely divided like a birdfoot. And we found it here at North Baldwin Lake in the San Bernardino Mountains, where uh, it's extremely limited to small springs and creeks there. And um, I've included in this presentation the Calflora links for these species and I'll leave this presentation with you all. So if you wanted to peruse these later on and you're at your leisure, you can do so. But uh, this plant in particular is endemic or restricted to, in, to the Big Bear Valley and Big Bear Valley only in uh, the San Bernardino Mountains. Uh, together with the slender petaled mustard, Bellipodium stenopetalum, they occur in alkaline clay soils and vernally wet meadows, not to be confused with vernal pools, in, uh, in and around Big Bear and Holcomb Valleys. Uh, one of the things about the slender petaled mustard is it's a food plant for that little green caterpillar in the upper right photograph is the caterpillar of the marbles, uh, Martin's uh, marble butterfly. And so uh, an endangered plant is in fact the host for an endangered butterfly. Now these two species were the first that I actually successfully have listed as federally endangered species. The, the first time I ever went out onto uh, the Forest Service to look for rare plants, I, I got off and out of uh, the, the ranger's vehicle and uh, stepped out onto this seemingly barren clay soil. And here was what's known as the Southern Mountain Buckwheat, uh, Areognum kennedyi ostromontanum. And it's a, um, a single, stalked, capitate flowered, um, silver matted buckwheat, together with this Bear Valley sandwort. And at the time, uh, they'd been collected by a few botanists prior to me, but there were no habitat notes as to what types of habitat they grew on or where they grew exactly. Most of the collections were from the late 1800s, where it would simply say vicinity of Bear Valley or San Bernardino Mountains. And so it was kind of like a treasure hunt to look for these things and to discover what their habitat requirements were and then systematically map them out. So with the Kennedy's buckwheat and the Bear Valley sandwort and this unusual little Indian paintbrush, uh, the ashy gray Indian paintbrush, which is actually a partial parasite on the Kennedy's buckwheat, you see it there in the middle photograph. These are all plant species that are restricted to a clay soil covered with Saragossa quartzite pebbles that uh, I actually had the honor of first naming this unique ecosystem uh, called Pebble Plains. 
And uh, the pebble plains are found only in the San Bernardino Mountains. It's a relict alpine plant community named for these uh, quartzite pebbles on the clay soil. That's a little dwarf pussy toes, Antonaria dimorpha at the side. And can you all see the uh, wildlife in the photograph? There's a um, small little uh, grasshopper there. It's called a tetrigid. It's a wingless grasshopper. Even the adults are wingless. That's restricted to this Pebble Plains community. Needless to say, these are all little belly plants, but they're left over from the ice ages when Mount San Gorgonio, just a few miles to the south, was the southernmost peak to have been glaciated on the Pacific coast. At that time, it held nine different Cirque Alpine glaciers that pushed their way down from the high country. And during the ice ages, the life zones, timberline itself, was as much as 3,000 feet lower than it is today. And so Big Bear Valley was then above timberline. And that's where all of these alpine plants came about. But then as uh, the climate warmed, trees climbed higher on the mountain slopes, generally overtaking the alpine plant communities, except on those clay soils. And the clays are almost uh, the snow and water runs off of them. And then they become brick hard and hot and dry during summer months, killing the pine seedlings. And so they've persisted as openings in a sea of conifers to this day. So you can see the kind of insular distribution of the pebble plains and their associated wet meadows with the checker blooms and, thelly and uh, slender petaled mustards. And uh, so I collected this data on these species and thoroughly mapped them out and explored them. And, uh, and then you can see that much of their habitat had been developed in Big Bear Valley. And so the case was very strong that these indeed were deserving of endangered species listings. And uh, for that, I have the dubious extinction, or this distinction of having listed the only two rare plants um, under the James Watt administration in the early 1980s. Uh, today, these pebble plain habitats are largely protected, the best examples of them. And, uh, and so we have here the North Baldwin Lake Ecological Reserve at North Baldwin. And these students, high school students, are out doing a monitoring program on the newly uh, established Moon Ridge, uh, Moon Ridge Mountain Ecological Reserve. So this is where I cut my teeth on environmental planning and environmental impact assessment. I would just show up at a hearing and uh, when it would come time for me to talk, I would uh, come up and I actually, I love to shoot down the biological consultants that had been there maybe looking at a project in late summer or August or out of season and they didn't see any rare plants, of course. So I would show up at the hearings and testify that in fact, there were extremely rare and endangered species there. And, uh, and they would look like total idiots for spending $100,000 on an environmental impact report that then had to be uh, turned down. And so uh, with some practice and doing this for a couple of years, I became a familiar face before the local city council in Big Bear. And uh, when the mayor of Big Bear was elected to the County Board of Supervisors, he appointed me to be the County Planning Commissioner at the time. And so at the ripe old age of 27, I became uh, the, the County Planning Commissioner representing the mountains in San Bernardino. And that's where I really learned about environmental impact assessment and how to protect rare plants from the environmental policy side. So as I mentioned, each of these rare plants has their story. And one of the first ones that I worked on as a planning commissioner was this one, the Santa Ana River Woolly Star. Beautiful sky blue flowers. It's 
endemic or restricted to sand and gravel washes, alluvial fan, sage scrub habitat, it's called, in the Inland Empire area of Southern California around San Bernardino, Redlands, extending into what now is the cities of Colton and Rancho Cucamonga and so on. Um, it grows on fine sandy soils together with this plant, the slender horn spine flower. These two are extremely endangered due to sand and gravel mining and urban and residential development. Here's a picture of their remaining habitat, entire remaining habitat in the upper Santa Ana River wash. And you can see that it's encircled with residential development, um, lots of flood control modifications along the stream there, the Santa Ana River wash, and sand and gravel mining to support all of the concrete and freeways and housing developments in the area. So uh, these sand and gravel mines were um, expanding rapidly. And just as these plants were listed as endangered, there was a road crossing and this uh, mining company opened up an illegal sand and gravel mining pit um, here on the right-hand side of the photo. And so they were running 24 hours, running trucks in and out of this pit without any permits whatsoever. So some friends of mine and I drove along this right of way, this dirt road that crossed uh, and crossed their sand and gravel access road. And we parked my Subaru, here's a Subaru for scale, in front of these 120 ton haul trucks and blocked them in the illegal quarry while I had newspapers and TV camera catching them in the act. So needless to say, they were shut down. So this was my first real um, wildlife warrior episode, I would say, where uh, me and Edward Abbey were uh, in spirit, were um, actively protecting our rare and endangered plants there. If you go out there today, that's it's the subject of a new habitat plan called the Upper Santa Ana River Wash Plan. And um, where they've set aside the existing uh, rare plant habitats and they're actively pursuing restoration projects there. So let me back up a little bit on uh, Environmental Impact Assessment 101 and just give you a short brief uh, history of the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA the federal rules regarding impact assessment and the California Environmental Quality Act, which covers state and local agency actions. NEPA and CEQA were both enacted in 1970, um, surprisingly by President Nixon, who signed NEPA into law on January 1st of that year and Governor Reagan um, signed CEQA into law later that year in September. And so these two bodies of really groundbreaking uh, legislation require that environmental resources must be considered in governmental decision-making. And furthermore, that they, they have to analyze and disclose publicly through public hearings, the potential environmental impacts of their decisions and in the case of CEQA to actually, they're required to look at uh, measures to minimize those impacts to the fullest extent feasible. So NEPA is essentially a procedural kind of set of rules that sets up the procedures by which projects, federal projects would be considered for approval. Um, whereas CEQA, governing all other state, regional, local agency projects, um, contains what's called the substantive mandate. And it requires public agencies to really consider all feasible alternatives or mitigation measures that could be used or incorporated into a project to lessen their impacts and environmental uh, impacts. Whoops. So the CEQA is 
really the the rules of the game in California as to how things get approved or modified or not approved. And so to know something about CEQA is to really have a leg up. Most city councilmen or boards of supervisors, they didn't know what this was until they became elected. And they might not know how to play the game as well as you or I do. And so that's what this talk is really about, to empower you all as to how to be more influential in these public hearing processes for environmental review. So the CEQA um, establishes protocols um, for reviewing projects and there are required hearings that they must have that uh, where they would review these things and they must allow public input. As I mentioned, it must consider all feasible measures to reduce these environmental impacts to the fullest extent possible. And this applies to all government agencies, except federal ones, of course, at all levels. So it's our oldest environmental law in California and really internationally, it's quite remarkable. Um, it helps guide the Department of Fish and Wildlife as the resource agency or responsible agency as to issuance of permits for um, wetlands or other types of regulated uh, resources. And it covers all discretionary projects. That is, if there's any choice or decision to be made by a local agency to approve or not approve, to adopt a zone change, to um, allow a highway or something to be expanded or um, roadways, uh, flood control projects, all of those things are covered. The only things that are not covered are um, ministerial things like issuing a building permit if it's within the zone, appropriate zonation for that type of uh, project. Basically, it covers most everything. So excuse me for this kind of technical flow chart, um, but uh, so a project or a developer comes to the local agency and says, we wanna build this project. The local agency then makes some initial determinations. And so they're gonna say, okay, is it exempt from CEQA? No, probably not, unless it's um, some sort of ministerial thing or a categorical exemption it's called. Um, uh, but uh, if it has any sort of discretionary decision making on the part of the local agency, then it's probably subject to CEQA. In which case the um, lead agency, whoever's in charge of reviewing this, the city or the county government or the regional water board or the state themselves, um, would prepare an initial study. It's kind of an environmental checklist a scoping document that determines what could be the possible impacts of the project. So let me show you what the initial study looks like. And usually the lead agency will announce that they've received this application and that they've completed this, this uh, environmental checklist. And you can see at the top here, there are 18 categories of potential impacts, ranging from noise and aesthetics to transportation, impacts on air quality, and notice uh, biological resources is one of the top ones there. And if there's any possible impact on any of these resources, a significant adverse impact, then they must prepare a, an environmental impact report. So they're going through this checklist. They're gonna do the checklist. And um, here's what the biological resources section of the checklist looks like. And without reading all of these categories, you can see that may the project have a substantial effect on habitat um, and so on. And they can check any one of these things, potentially significant, less than significant with mitigation um, or no possible significant impact, right? And so they're gonna go through this checklist 
and um, let's see. And um, and check whether or not it's it may have a significant impact or not. Um, many consultants, by by the way, are they're working for a client, the developer, and maybe they've done a lot of projects with this developer, and they want to continue to do those. So they may try to downplay their determination of significance in these regards. Um, you'll see. Uh, but, um, and this is where you, as the rare plant expert, um, can insert your opinion and say, no, in fact, um, there may be some effects on significant uh, wetlands habitat. Notice that uh, item C there, 4C, includes may the project have an effect on marshlands or vernal pools or coastal wetlands. And so they would have to check those boxes. And if it has even the potential for a significant impact, they have to check that box and that might trigger a focused environmental impact report. So um, I'm seeing some questions on the side. Can a government perform weed management strategies? That's um, a question. And uh, they, they may try to do that or say fire abatement where they're weed whacking um, you know, grass along the edge of a roadway, but there's endangered plants in there. Um, and if that's not brought to the agency's attention, then uh, they may go ahead and do that. And this is where it requires monitoring by local residents and experts. Okay, so um, there's another comment about consultants working for developers and they prepare these uh, environmental documents to minimize the potential impact. There's a word for those consultants. I call them biostitutes, but, uh, but we'll get back to how to defeat them uh, in the next slides. So at the bottom of that checklist, of the uh, environmental uh, checklist, I'll go back a couple. Notice that the 18th one here is called mandatory findings of significance. Okay, so mandatory findings of significance are these. So, and this is where you really have some strong, strong leverage in the hearing to require a full environmental impact report. And it reads, I'll read it to you. It's, says, does the project have the potential to degrade the environment, blah, 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 uh, reduce the habitat of a fish or wildlife species, so on. And here's where it's important. Threaten to eliminate a plant or animal community, reduce the number or restrict the range of a rare or endangered plant. Reduce the number. That means reduce by one. If it has even the impact, potential impact of reducing the number in, at all of a rare or endangered plant, then it's a mandatory finding of significance. An environmental impact report must be prepared. So, so when we're at that decision, that the local agency is deciding whether or not to prepare an EIR versus the other alternative is called a neg deck or a negative declaration. It means no potential impacts. So based on this initial study, they make their determination that based on substantial evidence, the project may have a significant effect, then they have to prepare an EIR. If there's no substantial evidence, then they can issue a negative declaration. That means project is done. They issue an advertisement saying that uh, the agency will issue the neg deck. They'll have a public hearing to uh, formally do that. And then uh, the project's over and done. They record the project and they move forward. Um, in questionable cases where there's controversy between experts, that could be you and the consultant, 
um, then they must err on the side of an environmental impact report. And then there are the mandatory findings. These are mandatory. It requires that they do a formal environmental impact report. And so in that case, then um, we are on our way because this is going to take some time and it affords the public much more opportunity to weigh in on the project and further consider that. So a little bit about the Federal Endangered Species Act versus the California Endangered Species Act. Um, and that would be that uh, on the Federal Act, the wording is pretty clear that um, when that the purposes are going to protect ecosystems which endangered species or threatened species depend upon and that these must be conserved as threatened or endangered species. They've only got two schools of that, whereas the California Endangered Species Act has endangered, threatened, and rare species. So um, with regard to CESA versus FISA, I love the PLANES acronyms. Under FISA, species listed as threatened or endangered. Endangered means in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. And threatened means the species likely to become endangered within the foreseeable future, okay? The CESA has a very similar definition, species or subspecies in which it is endangered if it's in serious danger of becoming extinct throughout all or a significant portion of its range. And again, threatened would indicate that it has the potential to become endangered if nothing is done about it. Either way, both of these are given full protection under the Endangered Species Acts and therefore are covered under the mandatory findings under CEQA. So how do we become rare plant experts? You know, when I started this uh, back uh, fresh out of college, um, I didn't know much about any of this stuff. And yet I, I just, uh, I explored rare plants almost like they were, it was like a treasure hunt, right? I was looking for the rare plant. Once I found it and knew what its habitat requirements were, I would then um, try to look for it more systematically. And after seeing a half dozen of its populations, I became the expert and I'd show up at the public hearing and say, hey, you guys missed this. You were out of season on your survey. Um, nowadays, it's much easier to get good information on these things. And so I would encourage you to check out on the state uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife website. They've got um, the California Natural Diversity Database runs this really excellent website where you can look up your own species. And I don't know if I can um, pull this up online here while I'm sharing this with you, perhaps not. But uh, I would encourage you to go and check out this uh, website. I'll leave the show with you and you can do this. And it's gonna give you the natural history of each of these rare plants that are listed as rare, threatened or endangered in California. Um, another way to really discover what's rare in your area would be the Cal Flora database, run out of uh, UC Berkeley, my alma mater. And um, so I've done some screen captures here as if we're navigating this on our own. But uh, I've checked the counties here, so you can look up any county that you want uh, and click on that. I've checked Alameda County, since uh, many of you are from there. And notice that here in the middle of the screen, there's something CNPS rare plants. So this is based on the CNPS rare plant inventory that hopefully you're familiar with. 
and certainly the conservation program directors in your chapters are very familiar with this. So check on CNPS rare plants. Notice there's also a box there for affinity to serpentine soils. You could check that. Or if you're working in a particular plant community, you can go down and scroll down through that and check the appropriate plant community. Um, okay, so I've checked CNPS rare plants. I checked Alameda County. Now I hit uh, search and here we go. And this is what pops up. This is alphabetical. So alliums at the top of the, the uh, checklist here. And I've got 52 records for rare plants, CNPS rare plants in Alameda County. Okay. So um, the first one here, Allium Sharsmithii, after Alan Sharsmith, one of our uh, famous uh, CNPS botanists from the Bay Area. Um, so let's look that one up. So you click on the highlighted scientific name there, and that's going to take you to the Calflora page for Allium Smithii. And ignore that highlighted county in the North Central Valley. You know where you are. Um, this is down here at Alameda County. And uh, there's also some of the Allium Char Smithii extending into the Central Valley, but it's just at the extreme southeast corner of Alameda County. Um, I could look up pictures of the plant on Cal Photos just by clicking there. There's a link to the Jepson Herbarium or Jepson E. Flora down at the bottom of this page if you wanted to look up more details about the taxonomy of. Allium charsmithii and how it differs from other native onions. Okay, but I'm curious about this. So I'm going to click on Alameda County. And as I click on the county itself, you just go down and scroll down and click on the county. Um, and it's going to pop up the screen that shows here's Alameda County and here's all of the collections of the charsmith onion. Okay. And it's going to list every collection ever made in Alameda County for the Sharsmith's onion. And so um, then if I wanted to click on any one of these particular collections, I'm going to go and click on one of these. Let's see. And um, that'll pull down. This is actually a collection by Barbara Erder. Um, and here's the details. So she collected this together with the East Bay CNPS rare plant uh, team, collected this on the 10th of May in 1997. And there's um, some details about where they collected it and so on. And I could go and look up every single collection um, of this species in Alameda County. And then I could click on the next county, right? All the way back to 1931, the very first collections of this were 1931. The date there is the 1st of January. I'm surprised you could see it then, but uh, in any case, you can see the collection history here and where it's been collected over this time. And then if I was, in, if I was you, I would just uh, hop in my car and head back over there on uh, some sunny Saturday afternoon and, uh, and see if I could relocate this, right? In season, uh, you see most of these are in May and, uh, and see if you can find it. It's like a treasure hunt. Okay, here's another tool on the Cal Flora website that's really cool. So um, this is kind of, it's only been up for a couple of years. And, um, and this, it's called What Grows Here. So you click on the tools bar up on top of the Cal Flora website, click on the tools tab, and it'll drop down this menu. And here goes What Grows Here. So I'm gonna click on that and see what pops up. So 
what grows here? So within this, you see there's a small icon on the map that shows where the center of my search area is. And over here on the side, you can click on any criteria that I want. I've already highlighted rare. So that's highlighted for me. I could click on serpentine. I could click on um, life forms, in which case uh, I'm gonna click on annuals, annual herbs. And so you can see here's all my rare plants within that search area of southeastern Alameda County. It's highlighted uh, 15 annual herbs, 14 perennials, two trees. I haven't looked those up and one fern. OK, so I'm going to click on annual herbs. And Here's another Sharsmith thing. This is a Sharsmith's harebell. Okay, so while I'm out looking for the onion, now I've got my eyes open for Sharsmith's harebell. I could do the same thing and click on the Sharsmith's, uh, click on the counties down here and look up the collection records for the harebell. I don't know if they occur right together. I suspect they might. Okay, so. I can develop a kind of search list of rare plants for my weekend field trip. And I'm gonna go try to look these up and become familiar with them. And then after you've seen a half dozen of these collections, shoot, you are the expert. And so here's my Char Smith's Campanula um, collected not far from that other collection site by Roger. I don't know how he pronounces his name, but I, he might still be a member of your chapter. And so on. So I can build my search list. And then I'm going to go out and try to relocate these, get pictures. If it's already rare and endangered, you're not supposed to collect it, but you can collect pictures all you want. Um, otherwise, you have to have a collecting permit. And it's a federal felony if you collect an endangered species without a permit. Um, so don't do that. But uh, in any case, so become the expert. Okay, now you've got the information. Your CNPS chapter conservation chair or uh, other program directors um, are going to perhaps be tracking the city or county uh, postings, public uh, public uh, documents that might indicate there's a new proposed development um, down here in the foothills above this golf course. I think this is actually in Santa Clara Valley. And in the foreground, we have some serpentine endemics, including this rare Dudleya. Okay, so um, you've determined that there's a, a project coming up and it may have rare or endangered plants in or around it or on the property. And so you're gonna go and present this together with other environmental representatives uh, to the Board of Supervisors or the City Council or Planning Commission, okay? So if you've never gone to a public hearing like this before, it's an interesting, interesting process. Whoops, let me go back. Um, to where, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes if it's a controversial hearing and there's a lot of people in the audience, they're gonna give you three minutes to say your piece, right? It's hard to say anything in three minutes. And so it's really important to submit your testimony in writing and to actually document that you know or you uh, have reason to believe that there are rare or threatened or endangered plants on the property or nearby, and that they must, under mandatory of findings of significance, prepare a formal environmental impact report. You can't say all of that in three minutes. So you have to have this in writing, hopefully on your uh, chapter letterhead, and then you submit that. While you still get to the main points of your testimony in that three minutes, but you also submit the testimony in writing. 
you want to document any of the rare plants that could be or are on the property or in the vicinity. And you want to be very detailed as much as possible about possible mitigation alternatives. Under CEQA, they have to consider any alternatives to avoid or reduce the impacts on a rare, threatened, or endangered plant. So this is something that I love to do in public hearings. And I get this all on in written testimony too. This is um, some testimony I submitted recently to the Big Bear Municipal Water District. The water levels are really low in the lake. And so they thought this is a great time to just dredge the heck out of it and try to deepen their boating access to docks around the lake shore. They didn't say where they were gonna dump all the dredge spoils, but in fact, they'd highlighted some areas that have checker blooms and other rare meadow species on it. And so I just brought this to their attention. And I always close my document, my, my written testimony and my verbal testimony with the mandatory findings clause. And so in accordance with the mandatory findings of significance, section 15065, you always want to use this little double S symbol. It's called the section symbol, um, signum sec sectum. And uh, as soon as you use that, all of their lawyers and attorneys perk their, their ears and eyes up because this is legalese. And that the project has the potential to substantially degrade the environment reduce the number or restrict the range of a rare or endangered plant or animal, they must, emphasis must, mandatory, prepare an environmental impact report rather than a negative declaration. In this case, they just pulled the project all together. They, they just recognized that there was no way they could get this project through they were proposing to approve this on a negative declaration. Can you believe it? A huge project like this, but that's the way it is. Okay, so here's the review process in a nutshell. There's Big Bear Lake in the middle ground and the San Bernardino high country behind you. So does CEQA apply? Is this a project where CEQA applies? That's the first decision to be made. And so to answer that, they do this initial study. And if they determine that the project may have a significant environmental impact, emphasis on may. So it is not necessarily true, but it may have. Um, then they have to prepare an environmental impact report. And so they're going to go through this on, on the checklist. If there's no significant, no, not even a possibility, then they'll issue the neg deck. And we're fine with that if, in fact, there's no possible adverse impacts. But um, oftentimes they'll try to come in with what they call a mitigated neg deck. That is, they'll propose some mitigation. Oh, we're going to um, avoid that to the fullest extent possible. But you need to get it down in writing on paper, um, as you'll see. Otherwise, they have to do the formal environmental impact report. And before they make this decision, they have to have a public hearing and they're going to give you three minutes and you're going to get that on the record that, hey, they got to do the EIR. Okay, so next. You want to build the record. So um, in this case, they, they went ahead and they did the, they had to do an environmental impact report. This is a project on the north shore of Big Bear Lake called Moon Camp. And um, it was first proposed in the late 1980s. And I took particular relish. It was proposed for condominiums and apartments going out on peninsulas into the lake. And it was just a massive project, which um, the bigger they are, sometimes the harder they fall. So that project went down in flames. And 20 years later, it came back as a reduced density project, still 100 units with still uh, crowded units along the lake shore where there's wintering bald eagle habitat. Um, so in this case, again, it was shot down. 
um, with a cadre of environmental organizations, myself, CNPS, uh, the Sierra Club chapter up there, um, and so on. And so finally, the project uh, proponents came back and they pruned it down to 50 acre or 50 lots. They avoided most of the rare plant habitat up here in the sort of orange red checked area um, and set that aside as permanent open space. They backed off from any development along the lake shore to mitigate for the wintering bald eagle habitat there. Um, the previous biological consultants had completely missed most of these rare plants, by the way, and misidentified some others. So um, we had to correct that for the record as well. And finally, um, so with all of these feasible mitigation alternatives that were suggested and ultimately adopted by the, the ultimate developer of this project, um, they were able to make these findings and the project was ultimately approved just this last July. That was kind of interesting. Um, public hearing during the peak of COVID over the summer. Um, and there were a bunch of uh, anti-maskers uh, anti there uh, complaining in the public comment period uh, to the Board of Supervisors. But um, <laughs> so that was uh, made for an interesting hearing. But ultimately the project was approved with me testifying on behalf of the developer. So they set aside all of this Pebble Plains rare plant habitat that we see in the foreground of this picture as permanent open space. And so this is where I want to emphasize to you all that if a project says that they're gonna set something aside as open space, um, I've been burned on this a few times before to where sure they set it aside and they fence up the lot and they give it to the homeowners association to try and uh, manage the habitat. Well, homeowners don't know how to manage rare plant habitat. And in fact, they often have a disincentive to do that. They want to walk their dogs out there and, and do whatever and do snow play and, and what have you. So um, I've even had conservation easements that were fully recorded. This is a legally recorded easement in the name of none other than the Nature Conservancy. And yet the Nature Conservancy brokered the easement to an asphalt grading contractor of all people. And, uh, and, and, and now you look at that same easement and all the fences are down and what have you. So that was kind of a hard lesson learned for me that these easements need to be duly recorded, number one. And the easement has to, this is recorded with the assessors, you know, the county assessor's office. So it goes with the land title. And, um, but it needs to include absolutely in clear language, the permissible and not permitted uses of the property. And it needs to specify who the legal holder of the easement shall be. And it should be either a land trust or a resource conservation district or a park district, not the homeowners, not anything related to the developer. Furthermore, to keep everyone honest, nowadays we're recording even a second conservation easement um, with either an independent land trust. So first one land trust has it, and then another independent land trust can hold a second easement over that one just to keep an eye over their shoulder. Or in some cases now, we're actually getting California Department of Fish and Wildlife to hold a second easement over the open space. This gives them, and mind you, they are the law enforcement authority for rare and endangered plants. So this gives them the authority to go on that open space at any time and check what's going on. Make sure that the responsible land trust or responsible entity is doing their job 
to maintain the fences, keep people off the property, and so on. So I would encourage you all to push for open space dedications in many of these projects, but that's not enough. You have to make sure that they have a recorded conservation easement and that the holder of that easement is a very responsible conservation land trust or the resource conservation districts are actually regional state uh, kind of quasi-governmental agencies like a regional water board, but this is um, the regional resource district. So uh, usually they have a watershed scale jurisdiction. So for us, we're using the Inland Empire, the Santa Ana watershed, uh, in Inland Empire Resource Conservation District covers the upper Santa Ana River watershed. Finally, the conservation easement should be accompanied with a non-wasting management endowment. This is a legally uh, deposited fund of money. In the case of this Moon Camp project, it was uh, $50,000 in an account that will accrue interest and uh, pay for the fence mending and keeping the signs up and what have you. So with this information in hand, you too can become a wildlife warrior. All you need to do is become familiar with some of these rare plants. Use Calflora. This is such an awesome resource. Use Calflora as kind of your treasure hunt and go out and look these things up and become familiar with them. Try to rediscover those old historical collection records and make note of where they are with uh, using iNaturalist and other types of photographs that are geographically referenced to really build up our inventory of information about rare wildflowers. And then keep your ears to the ground as to conservation threats that may impact these areas. And don't be afraid to show up at the hearings. Get this on the record. And you, you too can become a wildlife warrior. So with that, I will uh, relinquish my share and take any questions that you've got. Hi, Dr. Krantz. I'm Sen. I'm going to read you the questions. Okay. You game? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to roll back to people who are asking questions sort of in the beginning. So let me just pick up some of the things and you can say if you've already touched on them or if you want to go into more depth. So the first question for you is, what is a ministerial project? Does that mean that government agencies are exempt from CEQA? Uh, for ministerial projects, um, these are done under the regular ministerial action. So this would be like um, uh, routine flood control maintenance or something like that. Um, to where it's, it's a routine action of the agency where there's no real discretion involved. Uh, they're not making the decision yay or nay to do that. Um, and so uh, that would be a ministerial action. There are also categorical exemptions um, where certain types of actions are just automatically exempt, such as um, fighting a fire, now, definitely staging fire crews and things like that can have adverse impacts, but it's an emergency. Uh, even if it's not a governor declared emergency, those would also be exempt. But um, so those are categorical exemptions and ministerial exemptions are just routine activities of the city, county, state government. I'm not hearing you. Can you hear me here? Yeah, there we go. Okay, all right. I'm playing two games here. I've got one computer and one phone. So let <laughs> me get you the question. It says from Amelia, my school UCSC is starting a student housing project on coyote territory as well as grassland. Should I get involved with the county or the school? Uh, this is uh, on UC property? 
Yes, UCSC. Yeah, so that's interesting. So that's actually state jurisdiction. It's not, um, it's not county uh, unless okay. the, the land is privately owned. Otherwise, it would be a state jurisdiction. So um, that would go through, uh, often the UCs act as their own lead agency on those things. So, so to um, get that, involved, what should she do? So yeah, that could be kind of tricky because if they're acting as their own lead agency and they are the developer, then clearly they have a bias, don't they? Now, if it's just, um, this is where the trigger, if there are actual rare threatened or endangered plants on the property, then it's mandatory finding. They have to go through a formal EIR process, right? But that's kind of the, the big leverage is to actually find the rare plants on the property. Um, did she say that there were any? No, so it sounds like our next step is to do the research and find out if there are any. So, so drop a pin on that uh, Calflora database and um, just, uh, and then do a what grows here and check the rare plant um, occurrences box on what grows here. And it'll give you any rare plant within, I, I don't know what the radius is on the Cal, on the what grows here search uh, engine, but um, it'll give you the checklist of what's potential there. Okay. Now, this is a question from Anita over on YouTube. Can we look up rare plants on Califlora that are in the areas that development will occur and then do our own research on it and show up as well-read college students to hearings? Um, yes. <laughs> so, so, so absolutely, right? The, the same thing would apply. So um, wherever that development is, you can look that up on a map, right? So you go to your uh, Cal Flora, pick your county, any county, go and zoom in on that particular part of the county where the development's gonna be and, and then drop a pin, right? COVID. Um, on that map and it'll give you the rare plant search, right? Of any rare plant that's ever been collected within a certain radius of that site. Then you go through that checklist and, um, and go through each species that's potential there and look up that species on Calflora and see if it's been collected in that area um, or see if it's potential there. Um, again, pay close attention to any particular peculiar habitats such as serpentine soils, rare plant communities, things or uh, rather wetland communities. And you can search on those elements in the search in Calflora on that initial screen, but you can also search in your What Grows Here screen for particular habitats. Okay. Now th this is a, a bit of a story involved in this question. So I'm just gonna read you the whole part, the whole thing and you can pull out the pertinent pieces. Tim, it would be really great if you could also point out that environmental cons conservation begins through prevention. Your biostitutes work with developers to reduce their impact from the start at the project design phase. In quotes, hey, Mr. Developer, we found a jurisdictional wetland here and a rare plant population over there. You'll want to shift your project footprint to avoid them. That's where the conservation magic happens. The public doesn't see that process though. I'm a botanist at a private firm and I love what I can do for conservation and for science. So that, that's very true. And um, oftentimes, by the time the project comes to the public attention, the developer and the lead agency have already kind of predetermined what that project's gonna look like. But you will have the opportunity as a member of the public and as a rare plant expert to suggest mitigations and get those on the record. And, and you, one of those could be, if the developer avoided this wetland swale over here, not only will they avoid 
needing um, jurisdictional permits for development in a wetland, but they'll also avoid a huge headache in dealing with this rare plant species or chances are they there may be uh, animal species there too. And so um, that's where CEQA really has teeth is that you can't leave it up to the developer or the city or county agencies to design your project for you, right? They're just thinking maximize their dollar return on their investment. That is as many buildings, houses, apartments as they can do. And um, oftentimes, right? There are exceptions to that, but that's uh, a prevailing kind of paradigm in the development world. And so, but CEQA doesn't allow that. You're, you're absolutely able to suggest mitigation alternatives and anything that's quote unquote feasible the lead agency must try to accommodate that. So, Ed, you know, I've, I've worked with consulting. I was myself, uh, I've worked with many consultant companies over the years. Um, so I, as well as on the planner side of the table. So I've worked on both sides of the table for many years. And, and so I know how that game is played, but um, the bottom line is that I, you know, and, and developers around here, especially up in the Big Bear area, they don't want to see me showing up and get blindsided in a public hearing and shoot their $200,000 EIR full of holes. So it's got to the point where many of them actually contact me directly, proactively. They'd rather work with me up front than be blindsided after they've made all of this investment. And, and so um, it's good to develop a relationship where you can actually work on the front end to avoid the sensitive resources to the fullest extent possible. If that's not possible, say for a freeway or some sort of road extension that's got eminent domain, right? They're gonna do it. Then mitigation or offsite uh, protection, compensation, is called for. And once again, though, you need to be very careful that that offsite open space or whatever is fully protected with easements and endowments and a responsible entity to take care of it. I think that, that thoroughly goes into that. Thank you. It is really good to cover that. I'm going to go into a, a little simpler question here. Um, Anita wants to know, can we collect one sample of a native plant a native plant that is not rare or endangered to dry and press for field journaling and research. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's how we discover that something is rare actually is um, by documenting this. And I, you know, for me going back and looking at these historical collection records, they were very vague, you know, no habitat often was noted at all. It would just say vicinity of somewhere and so that's kind of the fun is going back and trying to actually uh, see what the particular natural history is of these things. But yes, so by all means, go out and collect. Now, one rule, and I teach this to all my plant students in my uh, California plants class, is um, one of the rules of collection is always look around, never collect the only one right? If you see that there's only a few of them, don't collect it. Try to find some more. You, wouldn't you feel awful to know that you collected the last one? But uh, so look around. <laughs> if it's possible to just take a piece and not the whole plant, do that, right? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. We have um, from William on YouTube. How do you counter the findings of a developer's survey conducted on its private land, i.e., which you cannot access? <laughs> Good question. Um, it's, it's funny with my classes, um, I've developed lots of ways of avoiding seeing a no trespassing sign. Um, look over there. Walk, walk, walk. Uh, so, 
most of these are, even if it's on private property, if it's undeveloped land, it's probably not really well secured. Um, but that is a real problem. If, if in fact it's well secured and private and you can't get back in there, then it's gonna be really tough to, uh, to do that. If you have reason to believe that there are rare plants on the property, but you can't get access to that, it is possible to set up a visitation, bring it to the attention of the local uh, fish and wildlife agency or resource officer, and they can make arrangements to double check that. But um, that's, that's a tough one. That's a tough situation. And uh, all I can say is um, better to be admonished uh, if you're actually, if someone's gonna catch you and tell you, oh, hey, this is private property. Um, I've, I've been known to strategically uh, find a way to avoid the no trespassing sign. All right, well, there's a tag on question to that. And that is, is there a difference in the legal protection of rare plants on public versus private land? Well, at, at a minimum, no. Um, even on private land, if it's state or federal protected um, and the owner knows that that is a protected species on their property, they cannot simply take that species. Um, that would be a felony under the Endangered Species Act. So uh, you can't willingly, knowingly just extirpate something. Um, even on private property, I've had this happen with checker blooms before, where someone was going to do some uh, maintenance along the roadway for their property on a private lot. And they had to give formal notice to the resource agency to give them time to translocate plants if need be um, as a last ditch thing. And that would be just to salvage some plants before they're bulldozed. Um, and that's often the case of last resort where uh, plants can be translocated, but that requires formal permits before one could do that. Okay. All right, you guys, there are like endless questions. <laughs> yeah, people are very interested in what you have to say here. Let me see if I can just pull like one or two more. And then I'm gonna say after that, we're gonna have to invite you back for another visit. Um, let's see, someone says, if, uh, I'm just gonna read this through. Okay, for, mitigate, for mitigation offsite, how can you enforce the mitigation actually working, e.g. that an equivalent or better population develops and persists? Um, really good question. And, and this is where one needs to have really tightly written mitigation measures that have actual um, enforceable uh, commitments written into the mitigation measure. So um, this takes a lot of practice and in, in trying to craft these uh, well-drafted types of measures that are actually enforceable. Um, even if there are, even if the measures are, are more generic, um, say that uh, they're going to set aside and fence an area, but then no one's maintaining the fences. One can bring this to the attention of the resource agencies and, uh, and get out there and look at that. And, and um, depending on the resource agency managers, they may or may not approach the private landowners. Um, we've developed a pretty good relationship with our local Cal Fish and Wildlife folks to where they are really good law enforcement officers when it comes to it. And I've had to bring them up and, and do uh, things on fuel abatement activities that the city of Big Bear Lake was just willy nilly weed whacking through the meadow along the roadways. And just to say, hey guys, stop. You can't do this. If you did it in 
August, it'll be okay because they've already dropped their seed. So oftentimes these things are easily Education. avoided or mitigated, but it, it requires um, a good neighborhood watch kind of uh, program. Uh, I would encourage the chapter to actually try to establish kind of a neighborhood watch thing where citizens can uh, report things or even take on keeping an eye on a property uh, that's in their neighborhood and then reporting that to the CNPS chapter and then the CNPS chapter ch or conservation chair and report it to the you know, responsible authorities if need be. And do you have any resources for some really well-written um, language that you could use to, that you could use for enforcing the mitigation? So, um, yes, I could, uh, I could share with some, some folks, if need be, um, some of the language of some recent ones, that Moon Camp project that was recently approved uh, we've got substantial mitigation measures in there that would if, ensure that the open space is truly open space in perpetuity. Yes, if you could share that, then when they send out the message after this, this talk, then they can share the links with everyone who's seen the presentation. Okay, yeah, we could do that. Awesome. All right, Madeline, I see you coming back on. Are you stepping in? I see Madeline is not stepping back in. Okay. I think you oh, got you most of the questions, Sin. It's amazing because Yay. there's, and I just want to say that as we said earlier, we, um, Tim is going to um, let us um, have a copy of his slides and there's a lot of great information in them. We're going to post them on our CNPS-SCV um dash scv website and also this talk is going to be recorded if you want to go back through it and get um information and it includes um questions and answers on the recording and if there's stuff in the chat that you want to keep a copy of um remember down at the bottom by where you type in your questions the three dots give you the ability to save chat um i know in east bay we People open it up for um, open up for um, spoken questions, but we've already had so many, and there's still a lot of people here. I think we really do need to have Tim back. <laughs> there's quite a hunger for these. Um, let me just put up um, the slide with our YouTube channel, and it's been in the. Um, It's in the chat as well. So this, the talk will be on our YouTube channel momentarily recorded as soon as this is over. Are there, um, Sue, is there anything else that we want to um, say before we thank Tim? Um, I think I think you've said it all. Um, we will have a link to your YouTube channel and to the document on your website, the to the copy of the presentation. So um, people in the East Bay who end up on our website can also, or anybody who ends up on our website, can also see it there. Well, I want to um, thank you, Tim, for a really fascinating um, and really informative discussion. And, um, and thank you for your commitment to um, protecting our plants. And um, I hope that you all who are attending this will look at our websites and come to um, more of our presentations. And um, I'd like to say good night and um, thank you. Tim, is, are we, we are, you know, is there anything else you'd like to talk about or are you okay? Um, just, um, you know, I'm really excited to 
to see all of you go out and actually take this on, become a wildflower warrior. They need your help. And there's no one else better to do it than CNPSers. Do check out my uh, PowerPoint. It's got a lot of the hyperlinks to, uh, for further information about the, the initial study process and, and the different acts and how to use Calflora. So um, go out there and, and protect those wildflowers. It's good to see you all. Okay. Good night, everyone.